Nick Castro is actually uh, the owner of Cellular Science, mm -hmm. and he'll go into his bio and everything. But okay. You go, Nick. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So. I'll just start with a, a quick story. So I started in ag uh, about 25 years ago. And I started under the pretense of what we're gonna talk about today, but I took kind of a different path. So I immediately started working for a very large firm, uh, Syngenta Seeds, which is, Syngenta is one of the largest uh, ag conglomerates in the world. <clears throat> and at that time, I was doing a lot of recommendations for growers, um, I was working on really big farms, and really I was an order taker, right? I was an order taker from, from my bosses, from the EPA, the USDA, from the growers, and basically everyone told me what I was going to do. During that time, though, I worked in research, I worked in um, sales, mostly sales for the last 25 years now. And in, in that, as an ag salesperson, we sell products, right? We sell fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides, insecticides. And I was always selling a grower a product. And so sometime in the middle of the year or middle of the winter, we would make a plan for their following crop. So in somewhere in December, January, February, we'd make a plan for their corn, their beans, their soybeans, or their wheat, or whatever it be. And we'd sit there and we'd, we'd write out a plan for how many thousands of pounds of nitrogen, how much phosphorus, how much whatever we needed. And this totaled up to, I was telling Chris earlier, anywhere from like 250 to a half a million dollars a year, right? And so we have this great plan, and everything was scripted. Here's when we're going to apply it, here's how much, and here's where everything needs to go, and here's what fields they need to go through GPS. So we'd, we'd apply it, and then we'd wait. And we'd sit there and wait, right? We'd wait all summer long, we'd wait all fall, and then somewhere around late fall, early December, I would sit in a combine. And for those of you who aren't familiar with like row crops, mm -hmm. we sit in massive combines and we just shovel in food, right? As this machine's going across, there's a little computer on the, on the dashboard. It's called a yield monitor. The 25 years of experience that I have working with one of the largest firms in the world, I got my degree from the University of Hawaii in Tropical Plants and Soil Sciences. I've worked in four different countries on three different continents. I've raised corn in five different countries. 25 years of experience, all the knowledge that I have, the thousands of hours of literally crying in fields because it got hailed out or whatnot, and all the information I've gained from farmers all over the world, all that got thrown out the window because I'm sitting here waiting for a yield monitor, a little computer, to say whether we succeeded or not. And every year this happens. And as an agronomist or a sales guy, I think what I recommended to a grower was the right choice. Unfortunately, to a grower, if he wants 250 bushels of corn or 3,000 pounds of oranges out of their field, everything comes down to yield. Right? Everything for my, most of my life came down to yield. So we'd ride the combine, and if, it was, uh, if the yield goal was 200 pounds and we got 150, my year was largely a failure. And that, that pained me, because I spent a lot of money and a lot of pain and sweat to get to where I was. The problem was, I would sit and meet with the grower, and I'd say, okay, well, let's make the changes. What do we need to do? So we'd look at a typical soil sample, and they would tell us we had X amount of nitrogen and phosphorus potassium. The problem is, I would look at the, the yield, I'd look at his field, I'd look at the soil sample, and I would take this shotgun approach, right? Okay, maybe we can lower down the nitrogen. Maybe we can add a fungicide later season. Maybe we could add an over-the-top fertilizer. Maybe we could do this or that. And really what I call the shotgun approach, right? Let's just throw a bunch of variables at the wall and see what sticks. The following season, we do the same thing. I changed four or five variables. We plant the field. He'd spend a half a million dollars. I'd spend all day walking his fields. And we'd wait. And we'd wait till December. Until a little screen told me whether I was successful or not. I did this for years, the last 20 years of my life. Up until recently, we haven't had a tool that showed us what was really going on in the soil. So as a soil scientist, as a soil biologist, as somebody who, who knows that every crop comes out of the ground because of what we grow in our soil, 
I knew there had to be a better way. I just didn't have the wherewithal to, to develop the, the program. Last year, I was the business development manager for a company called Biomaker. They have sequenced over 14 million different soil microorganisms in the soil. They not only have identified them through their DNA, but they know their function as well. They're going to get to 17 million this year. The next closest competitor is around 3 to 5 million. They are light years ahead of everyone else. So I got a really interesting look, uh, the, kind of the back office look at soil genomics, what we call soil genomic testing. And, and we'll talk about that in soil optimization. But really, up until now, we've looked at certain things in traditional agriculture, right? We focus on yield. We also focus on above ground traits, right? So we walk our fields and we're like, oh, this looks great. Uh, we, we walk cornfield and we say, look how green it is, it looks so amazing. Or we walk a wheat field and we say how big the heads are, or a sunflower field, and look how beautiful everything is, whether it's green, and green meant that we were successful, any other color meant we won't, right? <laughs> nutrient values, we focus on nutrient values. How much nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium is in the soil? That's what we're looking at. Every conventional soil test tells you the nutrient values. And then the other thing that we inadvertently built was a lack of diversity. We had one crop, right? Um, I was in soil, I was in corn genetics for years. I can tell you there's about 15 different lines of genetically modified corn on the planet today. <clears throat> there's about 3,000 different bags. So if each one of these were a different label of corn, there's a good chance all of them had the same genetics. There's about four companies who developed the line of code for, for corn genes, and that, that's actually strengthening. Due to technology. So we built a, a world full of lack of diversity. With that comes what? Disease, right? Pest and disease. So when you get a, a disease in a, a, like let's take bananas for example, the world grows one type of banana, cabbage. When we have a disease in Africa, it's pretty close to wiping out banana supplies all over the globe. And that's because when we get one disease and you have a monocrop, we don't know this, right? So that's what traditional agriculture has gotten us to, right? We focus on yield, we focus on above ground traits, we only look at nutrient values, and this will make sense here in a minute. So now that we have some newer technology, we can really focus on soil health. So the difference between what we've done in traditional ag and to what I'm showing you now is, we used to focus on all these things called yield and above ground traits. Now we're solely focused on soil health. And what we're really looking at is total soil biology. Biology is both good and bad biology. So in these soil samples that I'll show you, we quantify what biology we have. We don't ever say whether they're good or bad. We're always just looking at the total number. And the higher the biology, the healthier the soil, uh, which I think we can all agree, if we have healthy soils, we'll get healthy plants, right? If we have healthy soils, healthy plants, will get yield. Yield is a byproduct of soil health. It's not a byproduct of good, good genes and all that. That all matters. But you can have really good genes, just look at humans, right? There's really intelligent people stuck in really bad positions. And they really never amount to anything. Same thing happens with our plant, our biology. How are we doing? Good. Good. So another thing we get to look at now is our nutritional pathway. Traditional agriculture, we just looked at nutrient value. You'd get a soil test and it would say you have 10,000 pounds of nitrogen in the soil. But it doesn't say anything about your nutritional pathway. The one thing I like to share with people, and I also told this to Chris in the field when we talked way too long, and I was, I was almost late. Um, the technology were late. Uh, anyway, so we, when we look at nutritional pathways, what I say is, let's say we're building a, a, a train station and a rail system. But we built the trains first, right? We spend $40 billion in, in trains, right? And we all gather and say, hey, look how great these trains are. It's amazing. They're beautiful. Where do they go? Where are they going to go? <coughs> we didn't build the tracks for the train. When we talk about nutritional pathways, we look at nutrients, but we also look at the pathway for that nutrient to get to the plant. And the one thing I tell everybody is that plants don't eat. They drink, right? So all of the conventional fertilizers we put out are usually a small little granule. 
and they go in the soil and they get broken down by weather, temperatures, bugs, biology. However, if the biology doesn't exist, that nutrient never gets broken down. The pathway from the nutrient to the plant doesn't exist. The rails don't exist for the train to get going. And then the other thing is, in today's world, we're, we're focusing on diversity. We've started, even traditional ag, large ag, has, has started to focus on, we want to encourage diversity. So some of the products that, that I sell, that, that uh, Ann has used, and, and, and several others now, we have a product, it's, uh, this is a biological product, that product alone has 240 different species in it, right? And that's just because I'm encouraged, I, I just want to encourage diversity to build soil biology. So the more volume of bugs we can stick in the soil, the, the better the chance of them proliferating and really increasing our soil biology. So that's where we kind of are today, right? We went from traditional agriculture that focused on yield, above ground traits, nutritional values, and an inadvertently built a lack of diversity. Now we're looking, focusing on soil health and total soil biology, right? And we're going to look at these nutritional pathways and encourage diversity uh, and how we encourage diversity going forward. So this is really what, what you came for, right? This is a, a soil genomics test, right? I kind of pulled the names out of here. But this is the exact test that, that Ann has done, Peggy has done, and this is exactly what it will look like. So the very first thing we, we do is we look at the, at the very top line, you'll see up here, this is the total number of species that we found in the soil. So this particular soil, um, somewhere in, in uh, I believe it's Iowa, this soil has 652 different species. Again, we're not, go ahead. What is, what, define species. Uh, there are a variety of biology. So you have um, you have Bacillus. We've heard a lot about Bacillus, right? And then Azotobacter. Uh, you have Clostridium. Those are all different types. So. Um, are they like organisms? Is that yep. when you're so, talking about species? You're just talking about microorganisms. Different types of yeah, soil microorganisms. What's the range? That one has six. Different Great question. Great question. <laughs> I should have started with, every report we look at is neither good nor bad, right? It just is. So this is a snapshot. So for example, 652 is not terrible. I saw a report, I gave the same uh, speech on the way here through a Zoom call while I was driving, but I was focused. Um, <laughs> I've given this speech a million times. So he had 752, and this was in California, it had 752 different species. I've seen the, the number one yielding corn grower in America uses these products, and he has about 60, 60, I think it's 60, 62 species. When we started using this three years ago, he had 62. Now he has over 600. Okay. So, it really depends. The answer is, there is no, there, there's a range of zero to a billion. So any one handful of soil has over 40,000 different microbes in it, right? Depending on where you are in the world. In your backyard, there could be 40,000. You go to the middle of the Amazon, you pick up a handful, there could be 4 million, right? So it all depends on what has happened in your soil, um, weather, temperature, rainfall amounts, all these things. So the range can be from everywhere. Like I said, the highest, the, the corn, um, the corn yield winner for the last three years, his went from 60 something to 600 in a matter of three years. We've done a lot of work, we've put a lot of product on these fields. So one, this is just the very first top line, we look at how many total species are in the field. The next part of it is what we call uh, your mycorrhizae. Everyone's heard of mycorrhizae, it's a really popular thing you put on your soil nowadays. There's two different types of mycorrhizae. <clears throat> okay, there's an endo, Mycorrhizae are arbuscular, that I call it, and this report is called arbuscular, and then there's an ecto. The difference between ecto and endo, one, ecto, right, kind of outside, that mycorrhizae forms a relationship outside of the root. So if my finger was the root, the ecto kind of forms um, a barrier around that root hair. 
Okay, and it is the liaison between the soil particles and the root to the plant. The root's giving it sugars, the, the mycorrhizae's giving it nutrients. It's a symbiotic relationship, okay? Our muscular, the reason why they call them our muscular, is they infiltrate the root. They actually bore into the root hairs, and then they form nodules. That's called an arbuscular. Both are necessary. Both are necessary to exchange soil nutrients. And this is why we say that plants drink, they don't eat. Mycorrhizae do not have teeth. They're just straws. Okay? There's no way they can, they can crunch on a granular of, of fertilizer. So this ratio, we give this in a ratio, is 1 to 3.7. Peggy's question, is that good or bad? It's neither. What we're looking for is... Some will say a balance, and, and I disagree. But what we're looking for is more of a 50-50. We want it to be one to one. So this is one to three. I've seen it as high as one to one, 100, 100,000. Again, in that high-yielding corn grower, the very first year I met him, he said, Nick, I don't care about anything other than yield. I don't care about anything other than yield. And he told me money is not an option. Uh, money is not a problem. He throws thousands of dollars per acre to make sure he's the number one corn grower in the country. And he usually gets it. So this was way out of whack. Okay? We want that to be closer to one to one. And the reason why I say we don't want balance is because if you ever find yourself in balance, you might as well take a snapshot. This is never going to happen again. Right? We're never in balance. Nothing in, in the natural world is ever in balance. It's working in harmony with Soil doesn't ever get to a balance and say, oh yeah, we've got enough good and we've got enough bad, and let's just stay there. It's not what happens, right? At some point, the, the good outweigh the bad, and that's kind of where we want to be. But at, at some point, the bad creep up, just like we all get sick, we get a virus, we get a cold. It's that harmony that we want to build in the soil. So the closer this is to one-to-one, -to -one, the more harmonious our soil is, okay? Okay. The next part of the report we look at is our fungi to bacteria ratio, okay? There are good fungi, there's bad fungi, there's good bacteria, there's bad bacteria. Again, we want this to be closer to one to one. This particular number is one to 564. I've seen one to 2,000, I've seen one to 8,000. Bacteria dominates our soil. And then there's no two ways about it. This is one to 500 which isn't a terrible number. I've seen significantly worse. But think about bacteria, right? Most bacteria is associated with infection, with some sort of inflammation. And that's typically where our soils are on planet Earth. It's not an American thing. It's not a citrus thing. It's not a corn thing. It's just soils on planet Earth are very bacteria driven. Why? The use of herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and conventional fertilizer. High salt kills fungi, right? Um, fungicides are specifically designed to kill fungi, right? Fungi. Uh, insecticides, even Roundup, has an effect on bacteria and fungi, okay? So we live in a, in a bacteria-rich world, which we try to bring this total number of species up, right? To build, to focus on soil biology. We want to bring this arbuscular and ectomycorrhiza more to one to one. One to three is great number. And then we also want to always continue to look at this number at the fungi to bacteria ratio to make sure nothing's getting out of whack. So this is where we started from. Um, I would tell this grower, you know, in the next couple of years, we want to see this, this, this number get lower, right? We want to see a one to 300, let's say. Getting really nerdy stuff here. This is one to nine, one to seven. That's how many millions? Six is a million. Okay, so this is how much more bacteria, like one to 564 is hard to kind of imagine. But if you look, nine is what? Six is a, it's a billion to uh, 10 million, right? So there's a billion bacteria species in this soil for every, for every uh, 10 million of fungi. Okay, so that, that is pretty, pretty unbalanced, right? Um, and it, can, it could be worse, but that's just where the soil is. Okay, so any, any questions on this first page? We looked at total species, we looked at uh, mycorrhiza, 
and then we look at fungi and bacteria. Good? Okay, so the other part of this, we just look at soil quality, soil health, soil nutrition. Uh, what I really like about this test is it's not very scientific, right? Everybody can see these colors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Blue is good, yellow is bad, right? right? There's a lot of, there isn't a lot. There's only four companies in the world right now who are doing this type of testing. The other three give you what looks like uh, a scientific paper, right? It's very difficult for an, an average grower to even you know, comprehend. What What's that? Fathom what it means. Yeah, so this is why I love this, I love this test. So we just look at these numbers, but this gives you kind of a, a snapshot. This is page one of the report. Kind of gives you a snapshot. Um, we're looking at soil quality. You can see here biodiversity is medium. Uh, resistance is very low, and we'll, sh we'll show you why. Your soil health, uh, your biocontrols, that's like, do you have any natural fungicide, insecticidal agents in your soil? The soil does create that, th those products naturally. Uh, and then we also look at nutrition. Nutrition is probably my favorite part of the whole test, but again, I just wanted to show you the front page of this, this test, and, and that's the way it looks. <clears throat> is this like a typical, like I've had a soil test before, it's just an aggregate sample that you take? Nothing. They probably send it to the University of Florida. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they don't have it. It's each other. Yeah, no, so what you're sending but is it in, like a small amount? Yes, it's aggregate a sample. sample. Yep, yeah. so we do a uh, composite sample, what we call it. Just, it's anywhere from 80 to 100 acres, depending on the management zone. So the way I explain that is if you had a 100 acre field, 50 of it got manure and the other 50 didn't, you'd make two samples there. Okay. But if you had 100 acre block that was managed the same for as long as you know, just poke 25, 30 holes in that, make an X pattern or a Z pattern, and that's sort of what we do. <coughs> um, okay, so this kind of just, I just blew this up so you can see it better, but really what I always focus on is the nutrition. We will look at some hormone production and stress adapters because they're kind of fun to look at as well. The next really, this is page two of this, this uh, analysis. What's really interesting is that it'll run it through every known disease for your crop. And because they've sequenced over 14, different, 14 million different microbes in the world, this, your test will get run against every known disease of citrus from all of their samples around the world. So this tells you it's a, it's a really interesting way to look at it because, like I said before, I would say, hey, you know, last year 40 out of 50 farmers had uh, this disease in their cornfield. I suggest we add a fungicide this year just in case it comes back, right? Just in case, let's fling out $25 per acre of a product and let's kill every microorganism that comes in contact with it without knowing whether it exists or not, right? So we're just shopping them. This gives me a really good look into your field to say, okay, and this is corn, but most of these risks are low, right? So if I had a grower that has 20,000 acres, right, and I took this sample on one of his acres, and another one of his samples showed these as high, instead of scheduling a fungicide or any sort of insecticide or whatever I need to, this, this is only looking at disease. So instead of scheduling uh, a fungicide to, to combat one of these diseases on all of its acres, mm -hmm. I would only look at the acres that had like a high ratio, a, a high rating of that disease. Because this field is low, I would tell the grower, we don't need to worry about that, let's just keep an eye on it throughout the summer. Okay, so again, totally mitigating, you know, thousands of dollars per acre, but also focusing on soil biology. Right. How, do we, how do we maintain soil biology? We don't just go out there and fling out products just in case, right? It's more, it's, it's, it's better for the environment, it's better for the soil, it's better for your plants, right? <clears throat> so I always love to, to show this. It's just an, another really interesting part of the test that helps us make informed decisions, right? And then it also shows you other things that were not detected, uh, which is, which is really neat as well, but it just shows you the power of the test. The bottom part here is um, the, the biocontrol agents, all right? So this is, um, so these biocontrol, I knew I got filled up here. These biocontrol agents are not identifying 
a, like a like a fungicide that you went to track your supply and purchase. Right? That's not what we're finding here. And same thing for the insecticidal agents, the nematicides, and the bacterial agents. That's not saying that there is some like when I show this to people and they're like, hey, I've never sprayed anything, why did that show up? This is your soil's natural defense system. So this soil, this particular soil, does really well at building up a high tolerance to insects just based on its biology. Same thing with the fungicide agents. They didn't find any bacterial agents. Uh, what was that? <laughs> so what's interesting is this didn't find any bacterial agents. So if you remember, this did show up. There's, there's four that showed up as low, and there's two that showed up in here that were below low, but they weren't not detected. So you see there's a potential five, six different diseases coming in, and this soil doesn't possess the ability to fight it. So I, I love when the test kind of proves it because this is so new and people are like, ah, whatever. Here's the proof, right? We see it right here. There, there is a disease, and this soil doesn't have any natural defenses to, to, to fight it. We do have fungicide agents, we do have the mass agents, uh, and we do have insecticidal agents. So this is just the soil's ability to defend itself. It's not a um, conventional product that was applied. Plus your bacteria count was really high. Exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. Yes, yes. So a lot of bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> so page three of the report goes over two things. Hormone production and stress adaptations. What are hormones? So the hormones here, uh, your oxygen, your cytokines, and your gibberellic acids, these are naturally developed in every plant in the world. This is what helps it grow. So if you look at your oxygen production, this is cell division, stem elongation. Uh, early spring, you'll see oxygen production is really high. Cytokines are usually really high as well. That's just that massive growth stage of the plant. Sometimes you'll walk through a field and you'll be like, yeah, I don't know. Some of these plants are stunted. This happened to grow just, and it could be, based on the test, that maybe, maybe we just don't have the right hormones available. Because each one of these does something very, very important, right? This is cell division, which is that increase in mass, uh, leaf mass. Um, you got cell differentiation. Uh, you also have stem elongation and germination. So sometimes when people have issues when they plant seeded crops, they come back and they say, yes, I don't know, it was a poor stand. Let's say 85% of it germinated. First thing I'm going to look at is the gibberellic acid pr uh, production of that soil. If this is very low, I know that could partly be the reason. Also, again, to what Chris said, the, the, the bacteria agents are really high as well. So another really interesting part, it's really hard to make a whole lot of decisions here, but just increased biology will increase your soil's ability to, to create these hormones. <clears throat> the next part is the stress adaptation. So this number here shows kind of how many were detected. Um, so the stress adaptation is it's probably my second favorite thing to look at. And here's the reason why. Uh, there's, there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different uh, stress adapters in a soil that we look at, the, the really important ones, okay? The, the, the one that I like the most is this one that's called exopolysaccharides. Exopolysaccharides are, you have in every soil, you have clay, sand, uh, silt, sand, and clay, right? Clay particles, or particles. And in between those particles, you have these little tiny pore spaces. In between those pore spaces is something called exopolysaccharide. It's sort of like the glue that binds the soil. The higher that number, the, the, the more space biology has to attach to. So if we see exopolysaccharides really low, and we're adding a ton of biology, or we're adding just a little bit of biology, we might not get the jump in species that we want because it doesn't have a home. There's, no, there's nothing to hold it. So as we look at this over time, so when we'll look at Anne's second sample here in a, in a month from now, we want to see this increase with the addition of biology, right? Because the more biology species we have in the, in the soil, the more of that exopolysaccharide production is going to create. This is, this is the home for, for, for all good and bad biology. 
Um, it's kind of like the, the, the collector of, it's like a huge net in the soil floor base. The microscopic net. Okay, I won't talk too much about um, methogenesis and um, we'll, I'll just move on. But the next thing we look at is salicylic acid. Okay? Um, if you had some sort of issues in your soil, if you were taking over a, 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 a grove or something from somebody that you weren't sure was done there before, you can look at this bioremediation, this heavy metal solubilization, to really tell you how well your, your, your soil uh, is going to be able to fight against like iron, uh, heavy metals, uh, metallics, or maybe there was an old factory there at one time. People do amazing things to their soil. They, they, you know, they'll pour anything on their soil. A hundred years ago, people used to just pull the drain plug on, a, on an old tractor and let the oil drain in the field and then plug it back up and fill it right there. So we get a lot of interesting things in the soil. So this is a, a really interesting thing to look at if you're taking over some ground or, or if you just think there's something going on. So heavy metal solubilization really detox, detoxifies your soil, it's like sort of your natural detoxifier. But the really cool thing that I look at is salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is basically Tylenol for your soil. It's the anti-inflammatory for your soil. This is uh, acetyl salicylic is basically Tylenol. If you've, gone into, if you've gone to college and you took a chemistry class, chemistry 101, the lab is you've kind of made salicylic acid. And, and I remember doing it ourselves. But this tells me a couple things. One is, if we see this, if this wasn't detected in the sample. And that means that this soil probably isn't feeling any sort of stress. There's no inflammation for it to start to make its own Tylenol, right? Which is a really good thing. If we see this really high, we know that something's going on in the soil, right? There's some, there's some sort of inflammatory issue. Um, and so a lot of the large corn growers that I see, it's very high. Most of everything I see in the tomato and the pepper world, it's very hot, right? Because we're on sandy soils, things leach out very fast. It's hot, it's dry, it's windy, or we're stuck in the water, right? So all stressors, salicylic acid is usually hugely high uh, in this field, uh, in this field of life. Okay, so those are the two that I look at the most. Um, cytophore production is, is uh, like a biofertilizer helps to break down a lot of fertilizer. But this is page three. Any questions there? That was, I went through a lot of that. Okay. So, <clears throat> oops. Okay, so this is, this is the meat and potatoes of the report. Remember, this is your, your macronutrients, your NPK, and your micronutrients, right? That's probably what you ended up taking from the Florida so what you get from them is a, remember what I said at the very beginning, we're looking at the quantity, how much NPK is in your soil. That's what you get from any, any university or any NRCS. You get a number of how many pounds per acre, and you get a base saturation, right? Again, traditional ag is only looking at quantity of nutrients in the soil. What this is telling us is does the the road the rail the rail tread the railroad track from that nitrogen that you apply to the plant is it open or closed is that toll road wide open or is it shut down this nitrogen pathway in this particular field is completely blocked this individual farmer can put 10,000 tons of nitrogen in his field and he's probably not going to see that much of a difference because the, the pathway is blocked. Not to say that the nitrogen isn't in the soil, just he has no, that plant has no way to go get it. The biology doesn't exist to break down the three forms of nitrogen into a drinkable form, okay? So that's what we look at with all these. So you look at NPK, this is a low, medium, medium. Usually phosphorus and calcium work together. When there's low or medium phosphorus, there's usually low or medium calcium. If any one, if phosphorus is really high, usually your calcium is very low. Those two work in tandem. So if you're seeing some sort of deficiency, you're usually probably looking at the reason is uh, phosphorus to calcium. Okay. So 
really what we're looking for is we want to identify those specific uh, species that unlock those nutrients, right? So now we know through biology, now we know that there are millions of different species on planet Earth that exist that do a really good job of opening up the pathway to phosphorus, potassium, every micronutrient, and nitrogen. Okay? So the product, that, this activate product, has over 200 different species in the jug, but it also does really well, the main thing is it does really well releasing nitrogen, but it also releases eight other micronutrients. So, azotobacter is one of them, Clostridium is the other one. Clostridium exists in all of us in our stomachs. That's why it stinks so bad when you spray it. Um, it's just, it smells like a sewer. yeah, it smells like a sewer. It's 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 the active cultures in our bodies that break down food, which is why it does such a great job breaking down nutrients. So this this we're just looking at how do we target specific nutrient pathways. So if you remember my story before, as I worked with growers, it was always at the end of the season, we'd fling a bunch of mud at the wall, I'd change a few things and hope for the best next year. We'd wait for the combine results to, to determine whether I failed or not. And I usually failed because you didn't have anything like this to tell me, hey, here's what I need to focus on. All I need to do is find a way to unlock this nitrogen pathway and that plant is going to look infinitely better than it did last year. And this is a pretty good report. I mean, this the nitrogen is low, but medium. I've seen these all very low. Matter of fact, three of the pistachio ones that I looked at on the way here, um, I looked at before I wasn't looking when I was driving, but uh, they were all very low. And, and, and this is a pistachio farm that's, that's 12 years old. It's uh, one of the larger growers in California. They're very progressive growers. They're doing everything right in traditional ag world, but their pathways are blocked, completely blocked. So they have an abundance of fertilizer in their soil. Uh, so I'm always looking for, what is, the, what is the number one thing we can do today? Right? As business owners, we all wake up, and there's a million things to do. And when I work with individual business owners, I always say, what is the one thing we can do today? Like, how do you get a raise today? What's the one thing that I can change in my business it's going to make a difference today, and that's what we need to focus on. Same thing goes for soil, soil biology. What is the one, the most limiting factor in any production system? It's nitrogen. There's no two ways about it, right? Nitrogen is the number one limiting factor. So I always look here first, and then I look down below. But now that I know, okay, nitrogen's a big one. Uh, some of my micros are, are really low as well. I need to find a way to unlock these pathways. How do we do that? We just flood it with biology, right? We don't flood it with any biology, we flood it with specific biology. Mm -hmm. So there are products like Activate that, that have a bunch of biology in them, and then I have products that are just focused on phosphorus, potassium, calcium, depending on what your, what your test says. The only thing to remember here, or the biggest thing to remember here, is that it's not, it's not a measurement of the quantity of nutrients in your soil. It's, this is telling you whether the road exists for NPK and your micros to get to the plant. I'm pretty sure that's... Okay, so I probably should have went through this, but I blew that up a little bit. What this tells us here is the different ways that this nitrogen is broken up. So this is a... Um, HDMI cable sometimes. So this is an inorganic nitrogen release. Um, it also tells us about our, our non-organic uh, nitrogen consumption and then the nitrogen cycle. All these are low, but these are just different forms of nitrogen. So sometimes if you read the back of a label, it says NH3, NH4. Those are the inorganic and organic. NH4 is an organic type, NH3 is a non-organic type. It's getting pretty nerdy, but this just, it just helps us break down um, what's really happening to your nitrogen when, when, you, when we look at this. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see what else I have. Okay, maybe I don't have much else. The, the real question is how do, we, how do we build soil biology, right? Everyone always asks me when I show them this report, uh, every farmer always says, okay, well, what do I do now? Yeah. What do I do now? Yeah. And it's a great question, um, which I'm glad you all asked. Really is, we have to focus on nutrient use efficiency. 
So I think for the last 25 years of my life, we just focused on nutrients. Nutri how, how much nutrients is in the soil? How can I get more into the soil? And really it kind of took away from everything that we should be looking at is how do we use nutrition more efficiently? Right? How do we get every ounce of N out of that little pearl? If you look at phosphorus throughout the world, mostly the United States and the Midwest, phosphorus doesn't move. It, it, you can put, I used to put 150 pounds per acre on every field that I, I managed in South Dakota. Um, same thing in Nebraska. About 150 pounds per acre, and every year I'd do a soil test through the university, nothing would change. Phosphorus doesn't move in the soil. It's one of those compounds that is just stuck. It's stuck because of iron and these chelates, but it just doesn't move. Instead of looking at how much, we look at how much can we actually use? How much of our nutrient pathways are actually open? When we start to open our pathways, we're able to reduce that level of conventional fertilizer. So most of the growers that I work with, if they can stomach it, I tell them to cut back 20% of their, of their regular fertilizer once they use our program. That's because we're going to pull out with this product, we're going to pull all the stored nutrients out of the soil. I'll show you a, a test that we run in conjunction with this but and, and how we prove that. But really what we're focusing on when we're building soil health is nutrient use efficiency. We want to reduce the, the use of conventional fertilizer. And I'm not here to tell you conventional fertilizer is bad. They, they paid my bills for the last two decades. Um, it's not bad. It's, it's the pretense of what we're using which makes it bad. Like Roundup, right? Um, I used to pick it in front of Monsanto and why? Because I thought Roundup was bad. And, and don't get me wrong, it's a pretty horrible product. And then I went to work for it. You know, 10 years later, I was working for them, but I used to pick it in front of them. And they and hired they, you? Yes. Um, <laughs> and they promoted me, and they paid me to go all over the world. So, all I'm saying is, um, everything, has its, everything has its place, right? Um, I don't drink a lot of alcohol, but a glass of wine is wonderful, right? A bottle is terrible, right? Um, sugar is great. I love eating sugar. A whole cake is really bad. Same thing with conventional fertilizer. We have used, up until now, with most growers, we've used conventional fertilizer as the, as the silver bullet in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, my plants aren't healthy. Throw some fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Without understanding anything about what's in the content of the fertilizer, how much of that do you really need, what does it do to your soil, what is your soil pH, because if your pH is out of balance, most of your nutrients isn't going to get to where it goes anyway. So just changing the paradigm here is really what we want to do. And they're not bad, they have their spot, and we need them. We're just going to reduce the use of them and get what we already have stored in the soil. That's really what I want to do. So we increase the use of biological uh, products, and I think most importantly, we need to track this over time. So I tell everybody, you know, you can go and buy, a, on your way home, you can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, or Tractor Supply and buy a bag of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And you can go throw it in one spot of your grass. A week from now it rains, two weeks from now that spot's going to be greener than everything else, right? Unfortunately with biology, we can't just throw biology out there and next week it's going to be better, okay? Biology is a, is, a, is a living organism and it has to work in harmony with everything else in the soil. We're rewriting 250 years of agriculture, okay? And we've, and we've done agriculture for one thing, yield. Yield is the king. Every grower in America gets paid on how many tons go in the bin, mm -hmm. how many tons go on a train. And really that's taken us away from everything that we need to do with our soils, because it's really nuked our soils. We've, we've, we've largely killed our soils. So in order to really make sure we're doing it right, I don't want to tell people, let's just keep throwing biology out there, because then we're doing the same thing we did with nitrogen and phosphorus and test, just throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. We still need to track it over time. One of the best ways to do that is through genomic testing. So that test that I just showed you is probably the best way to do it, but there's, there, there are other ways that, that aren't as extensive as that, but it really is the best way to really hone in on what you want to achieve in your, in your garden, your grass, or your orchard. So what are some of the products that we use? Um, I'm gonna go through these quickly because I just want to get to questions. Um, but some of the products that we use is, is 
the one that I've told you about several times, Activate, that has 200 plus different species in it that break, that break down the stored nutrients in your soil. Unleash as a product is, what happens when we add a ton of biology to your soil? Is the, that biology, those microorganisms start to eat, right? And they eat like it's a frenzy. They eat everything in sight below the soil and they run out of energy. They run out of energy because they're eating all the nitrogen, they're eating all the, uh, the brown matter, the leaf matter, uh, the different bugs that are in the ground. They're eating all that, but they run out of sugar. So Unleash is a nice sugar source. There's four different sources of sugar in there that help feed that activate. Because what happens is when we feed biology, they need both nitrogen and carbon, right? They need both. If you just give it nitrogen, you'll see this huge spike in biology, and then all of a sudden they'll, they'll run out of sugar and they'll crash, they'll, they'll die off. So we want to make sure we're feeding our biology. Defend Pro is a uh, biological, uh, um, it's a biological fungicide basically. So I use that in, in cases where people have issues with any sort of disease. Um, we are going to start to work with this on HLB. That'll be determined later if, that, if that's really working. Um, but it is a natural defense. So it's not a fungicide and insecticide, it's a more of a natural defense. Uh, NutriPlan AG, this, this product here, I actually mixed them too to put it in smaller. But this is a product I use over the top. Really, it has a very small amount of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. But really, what it is, is it's an it's a, uh, antioxidant for your plant. So it's going to help it through that really hot, dry period, the really windy period, or the soaking wet period, where those uh, what we call abiotic stresses, the environmental stresses, that product really helps through. Uh, there's a lot of really good data on citrus. This APSA 80 product is what we call a wetting agent. And I use that for two reasons. One is, when we have this biology that goes on the soil, what we want to make sure that it does is it infiltrates the whole soil, right? A wetting agent does just that. Um, it helps infiltrate all the way down deep into the soil, 6 to 12, 24 inches down. Without it, what tends to happen is your activate, well, your biology will get into the soil, but sometimes it doesn't get as deep as we want. So that's number one. Number two is it also helps move water. So if you know anything about wetting agents, they're a hydrophobic, hydrophilic product. Hydrophobic meaning it hates water, hydrophilic means it loves water. Right? And I always, I always give the analogy, say this was a, uh, um, a wedding agent, this, this product, Absolute, has two heads. One head loves water, one head hates water, right? This head up here loves the water, right? And it's so pouring rain, pouring rain. So it's going to stick up here out of the soil, right? And it's going to say, I'm going to hold on to that water. What it does is it brings that water down through the soil column. So it pushes that water down. When it gets super dry out, that head flips. The molecule flips. The, the, dry, the dry loving head is now like, oh yes, give me air, give me air. And what it's doing is pulling that dry air down into that wet soil column. So what it does is it helps dry areas that are normally wet out, but it also helps penetrate into the soil whatever product you're putting up. So you really get a lot of activity when you add the two together. Uh, those are, kind of, those are kind of the products I use. I've got a list of about 30 others that I recommend to growers depending on their test. But all in all, the only thing I, I think I, what we really want to drive home today is this, right? To build soil biology, we want to increase biological products. We want to just reduce the use of conventional products. I'm not saying that we need to get rid of them. And really the focus is on how do we use our nutrients more efficiently? Really at the end of the day, that's if we would have done that 250 years ago, our soils would be in a much better position than they are today. Any questions? I threw a ton at you all. Um, any questions? Do you want to see a good sign for you guys? And you know how you guys were wondering about um, your flowers? Your, well, weren't you talking about having, like, take care of the... Oh, the, oh, yeah. The Kogan grass? Yeah. Have you ever heard of Kogan grass? Kogan grass? No. It's like a very invasive 
it's a very evasive type tri of grass, and where we live here in Brevard, it's like ruining pasture. Okay. It's very hard to get rid of. Mm -hmm. um, even like, you know, you could throw like the gnarliest um, stuff on it and lay silage on it and it still comes back. Interesting. <laughs> um, but we read that you can use pigs and that it will eat the like legs on the oh. ground. And mm -hmm. that that is like highly effective. Um, yeah, so we're like kind of curious because I have a pasture that I would like to put cows on, but I can't because COVID and the rest took it over. <clears throat> there, is it toxic to cows? Uh, not it's toxic, sorted. they won't eat it. Won't it's sharp. sharp. It's sharp. It's got little yeah. sod laying yeah. down. Sharp. Like when yeah, you walk through grass, it feels like it's and cutting and you. It's like oh. again. Yeah. Oh, C O G. Oh. And yeah, so like after you walk through it, your skin will feel a little irritated. Mm -hmm. like, it's interesting. Like but we have a natural way to get rid of it. We've been trying to spray, something. spray, yeah. and, then spray yeah. and then spray again, and then spray again, and then you have to sterilize your soil, and then life stuff. Like, you know, uh, we eventually, I eventually would well, like to have a like, very large garden or something. Yeah. Sterilize yeah. the soil. No way. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the farm soil in about pure 4600, which is pure nitrogen. Mm -hmm. This soil has 5,400 pounds, what is that, two, four, two and a half tons of nitrogen in its soil, stored up, that this soil is not using, okay? So you just need to free it up. Right, so mm -hmm. two and a half tons, one ton of nitrogen right now on the farm is around five, 600 bucks. He's got two and a half tons of it. That's per acre. This He's particular got farmer, He's got gold this yeah. particular farmer is a 20,000 acre farm. He does turf grass on, on the other side of Florida. So I look at this test, right, which we did with Ann as well. So we looked at, to, to really know what we're doing because the one thing I don't want to do is just say, hey, look, your nutrient pathways are blocked. Um, let's just go put activate out and unleash on it. Well, we've got to have something to unleash. Yeah, definitely. So, so, yeah, so there's nothing in the soil. So this particular individual has 5,000 pounds of, of nitrogen, 1,000 pounds of uh, phosphorus, 400 pounds of potassium, and look at how much calcium he has in the soil. 25,000 pounds of gypsum. Gypsum is pretty cheap, but 25,000 pounds is not cheap. Right. right? So he, this individual has been putting gypsum out every year for the last... Uh, it's been his farm's been in the family for 65 years. I guarantee you, the grandpa's got some money here. <laughs> There's yeah. guarantee that what I told him. I said, your grandpa. Your, your inheritance. Yeah, your dad. <laughs> your, your dad put some of that in there, and so what we're trying to do is unlock that. So again, another sample that I use, uh, another analysis that I use at the first time. We do. I only do this one time to kind of make sure what we're able to unlock. And that way I could tell this guy, I said, you can cut back your nitrogen by 50%. Uh, he told me I was crazy, but we're gonna, we're gonna do a side by side and then test it out, see, see how it cool goes. But um, anyway, I just wanna show you, there's another really cool tool. What was the name of that test? This is called a, uh, a total digestive nutrient test out of region ag labs. Um, and if you, if you wanna take down my info there, um, if you email me, you could certainly, I'll give you that info for how to send all those samples in. Um, they do, um, the genomics test is about $199. It is spending, but you can do it over a lot of acres. So if you had, you know, 80 acres, let's call it five bucks an acre. If you had 100 acres, let's call it two and a half dollars an acre. So it sounds like a lot of money if you have small acreage, but we only do it one time. Right, so um, the genomic test I would like to see two or three times a season, um, and it really depends on your goals, right? So uh, don't hesitate, email me, call me. Uh, you can check out my website, it has, has some of this information on it as well. But I think the, the most important thing is, one, to focus on biology, right? Focus on nutrient use efficiency, uh, because diseases won't stop, right? Genetics, they say that uh, genetics has gotten us to a plateau in agriculture. Mm -hmm. The last massive increase in yield has come from plant genetics. And that's kind of plateau. We, we kind of hit the, the top of the curve. We're probably not going to see any more yield from genes anymore. Uh, and that's mostly because we got really good. The science got really good. There's a product, uh, a, a system out there called CRISPR. You mm -hmm. may have heard of it. <clears throat> when I was managing fields in Hawaii, um, I had 40,000 different lines of corn come through every year. I looked at 40,000 different types of genetics. That has went from 40,000 to about four in a matter of 10, 13 years ago. And that's because CRISPR is a predictive tool. So instead of just throwing it all out in the field and us analyzing to see which one did well, this, this kind of AI tool uh, helps them say which ones are gonna work, which one of us. So we've reached probably our maximum when it comes to genes and plants. The next yield bump will come from technology and biology. And, okay. and really, as far as the tests go, I spend more than that on fertilizer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so now I don't have to spend it on fertilizer because he found out I can lay up on the fertilizer at yes. 20%. Right. So what I'm spending in the tests, I'm actually saving. But not only that, I'm also unlocking everything that I already have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay.
I'm, I'm curious because you always generally do crops. Like you're, you're growing what? What are you? I'm flowers. 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 Yeah. flowers. Yeah. Um, I have like a vegetable garden. Vegetable garden. Um, and everyone has different products, but I just only have grass. Yeah. And so, how would that fill in? I mean, do you do a lot of turf grass and things like that? Oh yes, the turf guys are my favorite customer because they apply a lot of products. I know they do. <coughs> um, uh, golf course is my second. Yeah, I was going to say golf um, course is my kitchen. <laughs> but really, I mean, those those are super users. And my thing with golf courses is, you know, we live really close to the ocean, as most of you do. Um, the reason why we moved from South Dakota to Florida is for the ocean. And every year, uh, you see this red tide come through. And I'm not going to blame any one industry, it's all of us, right? It's, it's agriculture, it's industry, it's golf courses, uh, turf. I have, I have an amazing lawn. Uh, people stop in front of my house and tell me how amazing my lawn is. I put a lot of product out. I use a lot of biologicals, a lot of organic product, but I put a lot of product out. The average homeowner is the most dangerous thing to the environment, right? He goes to Home Depot, he buys a bag of nitrogen, and he buys a jug of Roundup, right? Flings out the nitrogen without even measuring anything, and he sprays, if the, if the rate of, of Roundup is six ounces per gallon, He's like, well, six works well, let's do 32, right? 32 will burn the heck out of it. And that's why we are where we are today. But really, I love to work with golf courses for that reason, is because if we can, like, I got, I got a 15-year-old in a golf course, right? Like, wow, what we're handing them uh, is, is quite scary. It's and, not soil. and if you look at soils around the world, it's, it's really scary. Yeah. Um, I was just reading a, a, a report. I have a, a speech in in Washington, D.C. this October that I'm trying to build this kind of TED Talk for. And I was listening to a soil biologist saying we have 60 years left of production in the United States if we don't do anything today, um, which is really scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, 60 years, I'm still alive. <laughs> well, my kids, well, yeah. right. <laughs> um, but you think about, yeah, and you think about just our overall environment, the things we all enjoy. Uh, the things our economy relies on, uh, our environment, uh, you, you know, you do ecotourism or ag tourism. Think about all the things that our, that our environment gives us, um, and I think we've neglected it for, for many years. Now, here's something, you know, as soon as she started talking about cattle and such, then it made me think in my pasture, I really want, you know, the quality acre, the quality seeds But here's something that I thought of, thinking about the soil health. The whole reason why we can't grow quality grass here and why we have to grow crab grass is because of our soil. But if we're building up the biology, could we ever grow like the Kentucky grass? Kentucky Bahia. grass would be tough. Bahia, yes. Oh, yeah, we have Bahia. Yeah. Yep. I'm thinking of, um, I'm, I was thinking of uh, Timothy. You can, but it just requires a lot of management. And it just really yeah. requires. Good, rich soil. Yeah, it would just become cost prohibitive because you would have to have. Kind of it if we build it up. Yeah, uh, so the biology is one thing, yeah. but we still have to have the soil structure. Yeah. So you yeah. still have to have a high organic matter, yeah. heavy compost. So right now you have really sandy soil. And that. That was so right yeah. That's yeah. actually my main question I wanted to ask you was have your sandy soil because my property had to have a lot of fill dirt brought in over a really long period of time. So like my native soil was like probably four foot under the ground. And so like I'm constantly amending with compost and I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. You know, like I didn't know about your product, but I use a product called like kangaroo roots and um, help me help you trying to build micro more micros in my soil. But like the compaction of the soil really is prohibitive to getting good tap roots because the soil just doesn't have enough in it. I, so I'm like, you know, I don't know, like, it almost seems like all in vain, you know, in a way. Like, How big is your garden? Like, I mean, are we talking like a backyard kind of garden? Or yeah, a large, a large backyard garden, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, and that's another challenge. So what you're doing, I think, is the right way to go. Um, you can use, so the compaction, the wetting agent that I have, that we use, that's a really big helper. Uh, it's not organic. It's biodegradable, but it's not, wetting yeah. agents aren't, neither or. Um, there's no nutrients in them, so they don't really identify as organic or not. 
but um, but it's mad. And we can't get good yeah. compost here in Florida. Like our compost is such trash here uh, that I constantly and you know I bring a dump truck of compost into my garden and it's just full of contaminants. Yeah. So what you really need to do is find uh, somebody who has a bunch of chickens and horses. Well, I do. I have a large flock of chickens now. Okay. I've been making my own compost. Yeah. Now, but yeah. yeah. And that's really, I mean, when you use the counties. Yeah, yeah. So uh, finding good sources of organic matter is really the best you can do. Oh, yeah. I have access to those sources. Yeah, so wow. chicken manure is, um, is, I mean, they're both great manures. They're both full of nutrition, but chicken manure is more readily available. Horse manure mm -hmm. is about three years, so you get like a third, a third, a third. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the only thing you gotta just watch out for is the timing of it, right? So you don't, you know, you can get um, a lot of diseases from chicken manure. So you want to make sure it's either well composted or it's banded in rows that aren't actively fruiting. So like when it rains, it'll splash up. Uh, yeah, that's how a lot of okay. our diseases are coming in on our lettuces and whatnot. Um, like your. Uh, Right. But, 
but um, that that slide I just showed you yeah. was from a was from a Sandy. I mean, oh, was okay. from uh, Sarasota. Uh -huh. um, when I put, I mean, it's pure sand. It's black sand, but it's pure sand. He has some organic matter, but it's it's pure sand. I could show you. Yeah. Some spots it's orange. Yeah. And I'll show you another. Um, so this is another report that I, I show people. Um, this is a soil health report. But um, so I use all three of these. I use the genomic test I showed you, the total digestive, and this one's called the the same health health. But this shows us. Um, yeah. So this shows. This shows you your, your microbial active carbon. Mm -hmm. And this is just a, a number right now to you, but um, the reason why I look at this is because for that reason. So this was that individual's field. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the, the turf grass. Yep. This is in Sarasota. Uh, well, this is bamboo, uh, but none, nonetheless, same farm, okay? Um, the reason why he started growing bamboo is because he lost all of his citrus. Right, and I've heard about it. But anyway, pure sand, pure sand. This was like white sand when I sent it, and um, when they got it in Nebraska, they're like, "Nigger, you sent us samples from the beach." I'm like, "No, this is a this is farm." Uh, so, but we, we get a look at really cool things. So this this soil respiration, this is a number of how well that soil is exchanging oxygen with the air. Uh, but even still, what I'm saying is. You can see that we have we have nutrients like there. Yeah. It is nutritional. Right. Yeah. It just leaches out very fast. So yeah. the the addition of organic matter is what leads to that. Yeah. This. Um, so we just gotta start making compost. We just gotta start. That's my. Twenty twenty four is my closing down circuit in my mind. I want to close this system. I don't want to bring. I don't want to bring stuff in my garden. So I need to study how to get to that point. Yeah. yeah so all of your. All of your plants that once they're you're done harvesting, you just put back in the soil. Yeah. In your like practical knowledge, have you ever seen where people have been affected with cover cropping to increase the organic matter in their soil over time to really get all that root structure and stuff? Right. Like, what do you mean by affected? Well, like <coughs> my my soil is really sandy, so I my idea is that over time, if I cover crop it enough. I, I'm going to get root <coughs> and break it up and start to be a good soil. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question is, do you, have you, do you know what is the best type of cover crop to do? Well, there is no best. It's no best. Mm -hmm. okay. um, clover is really good it's for our soil. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. cheap. It's it's cheap. cheap. I just bought a massive bag. And you can oversee the heck out of it. Yeah, and my chicken is allowed to eat it, which is a win. <laughs> exactly. So, um, here in Florida, I use, I tell a lot of people, I even flirt with the idea because I'm a lawn guy and I just do weeds. So I told my wife, I'm like, I'm gonna make a grass clover. Yeah. You know, clover wool. I haven't done that. But you can use it for that reason. It traps bugs, bugs love it. Uh, it, it, it is, it's easily tilled in and under. It doesn't get really crazy invasive. Uh, and it does add organic matter. Another thing that we're adding when you're so when you're putting a cover crop, you add those roots, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of those roots, remember that one slide I showed you with yeah. hexy poly polysaccharide? Mm -hmm. yeah. That is giving that that to the soil. It's giving your soil that kind of the mucus that kind of binds us. You know? But if we till it, are we ruining all of that? Like how does tilling affect microbiology? Yeah. Because like right now it's real trend is like no-till oh. garden, don't till. But yeah. to be honest, if I don't till, my yield is very low, very low. So I wonder, like, as far as if I'm going to just kill all this hard work I'm doing every year by selling it? Um, but it's not as good, isn't it? Well, so what does it do to your what does it do to your biology? Um, the same thing it would do if you stuck your hand in the blender. Like, that's what's happening to your biology. Yeah. However, biology comes back a lot faster than our fingers. So <laughs> there is that, but it is destroying biology. Um, the one thing we want to do is minimize tillage. Yeah. Okay, so, so depending on what you're crops, using. And I keep saying, we cover crops. I want to turn that over. I want to put all that green in. Yes. Well. So you're suggesting to 
carpet. I would or use a shovel. And literally just turn it. Great, I'll do that for gross, so gross, what gross, gross. Yeah, it's painful. painful. <laughs> but so are you using like a hand tiller? Yes. Pines? Yeah. It's pretty destructive. So biology. What you're, why that's, you're seeing a better? That's the best tiller. Yes, that's the best tiller. Yeah. So well, he's talking more about flipping the crop, flipping yeah. it, just flipping it, just flipping it to that way. I'm using a motorized tiller. You're using a land blender. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about just yeah. flipping. But I really yeah. been playing with the idea of stopping because I'm cover cropping so much, trying to build the soil, yeah. and I'm like, this seems kind of productive. Yeah. So what you're doing when you're when you're tilling, you're adding a ton of oxygen to the soil, yeah. but you're also removing a ton of carbon. So every time we flip that soil, even with a shovel, we just flip it, okay. that carbon that's stored in there is being given up. The best carbon capture on planet Earth is planting trees. If, if the world can just get on board with carbon capture and plant more freaking trees and stop deforestation. I'm just I'm just wondering, we talked about leaves, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Leaves. Could you get a bunch of poop leaves and stuff like that and put it in there and then till it and then would that help a lot? Yeah, so what we look at there is your CNN ratio, right? Your carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, mm -hmm. Your brown leaves are carbon. And how about, how about, how about pine leaves? Pine yeah. leaves. So if they're green, they're the end, right? But if, they're, they're, if they're brown. But if they're brown, it's still carbon. Right. So what happens is when we add biology, mm -hmm. it's got a bunch of carbon. Carbon is sugar, carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So they get really active. They explode. Mm -hmm. And they'll leave all the nitrogen that's there. Mm -hmm. And what we call, what we create is what we call a nitrogen sink. Mm -hmm. You actually deplete your nitrogen because you have too much carbon. Leaves and whatever you do for composting, you want a 50-50 mix. Three and brown. Okay, three and brown. Yeah. But you but as far as tillage goes, we really want to just minimize tillage. Because it is destroying biology and we're losing a ton of carbon. Now have you seen worms in the soil down here yet? <laughs> <laughs> very, 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 few. very few. They're like yeah. so when I find them, they're in like the deepest, the funkiest, the uh, you know what I'm saying. The reason why I'm asking is because we're starting my worm thin, mm -hmm. and yeah. I've been taking my worms. It's the red one. It's the red one. It's the red one. Yeah, yeah. The, the good ones, not the bad ones, with the weird right. head. Yeah. Sure. But I've been putting, you know, my compost yeah. around my trees and stuff. I've got worms everywhere. My neighbor even. Yeah. He's like, hey, your worms are escaping. I love it. I love it. So I love is it so. changing the biology? Yeah, yeah, the the worms are yeah, and you're also lowering the salts. So, mm -hmm. you know, worms, like whenever you get a, a blister or a burn, you know, like yeah. water stings from a blister, mm -hmm. that's a worm's whole life mm -hmm. is that fresh skin, right? So yeah. they're extremely sensitive to yeah. salts, uh, high yeah. nitrogen. They're extremely like they will they will leave if it's not ideal. Yeah. So just the fact that you know I figure our soil, you know, being in Florida should be really salty, but it must not be too salty because now the worms are just mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah, and you're changing. Yeah, you're changing. And they're changing the biology. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, and you're lowering that salinity rate. And now they're actually coming up on the sidewalk when it rains. That's a great thing. Yeah. And you. Yeah. yeah, I think the best way is you know, cover crop as much compost as one can, can get their hands on financially. Uh, worm castings, and then nothing goes to waste, right? Nothing goes to waste. Uh, grass clippings, uh, you know, anything from the kitchen, everything should go into a composter if you have it, or directly into a piece of soil that you're not using. This mm -hmm. And, and, and so that's why I say use that Same. stuff. Uh, pig manure is really not the greatest stuff. Oh, I know it's not great. Um, listen, I had a pin in my head in the wall, right? <laughs> of where the pigs when I was raising them when they were piglets. And it's like a 12 by 12. The pigs are neat. They poop in one corner. So I, just, I threw food, all kinds of stuff. There's like 50 tomato plants in there. There's corn plants. Oh, after I moved them out, they're going like crazy, right? They're poop corners. Yeah. Not a thing. <laughs> so I'm like, not a thing. Yes. So I'm like, not happening. Yeah. So there's a volunteer wolf grub. 
Like, clearly, it's not what I want. <laughs> if tomatoes don't grow, yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, yep. Yeah. yeah, like I said, um, you have to you have to design systems around your outcome, desired outcome. Yeah. For 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 your for your vegetable garden is much different than a flower garden, which is significantly different than a than an orange grow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which is infinitely different than a corn crop, right? So I would say you know manage the outcomes. Mm -hmm. There's no one system, right? There's no one great system. But just the fact that you're thinking about changing the way you grow is yeah. infinitely better than yeah. growing yeah. healthy, growing well, biology. Well, I think it's because like, we're soil farmers and people have to get down to the ground. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the yeah. only yeah. thing yeah. that yeah. we're not mm -hmm. making any more of on planet Earth. Yeah. And it's probably the one thing we're losing faster than anything. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Terrible stuff. I heard you say that you studied orchids. I just watched a documentary on Netflix about this British dude that was in Colombia getting orchid, rare orchids, just really rich dude, um, like a, I don't know, a cow or something, and he got abducted by gorillas. And he spent two years with gorillas because he was trying to get these orchids. Amazing. And it's like his story and what happened. Just random, but I'm just yeah. so like, like orchids. Yeah, it was like they're <laughs> and like how he and the, and then eventually after his two years of being with these gorilla braids and rain forests, they're like, oh, you really are a side. You're just really a wicked dork. And they let him go. They let him go to the end. That's so cool. That is, that is funny. That is yeah. funny. Yeah. 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 Uh, Chris and I were talking about you know the competition from Mexico with a lot of a lot of products. Israel's another one. Uh, like you shop at Costco and you get fed these uh, bell peppers. A lot of them are coming from Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that to me is really scary. But also, for a couple of reasons. One is we're, you know, you're flying mm -hmm. millions of miles to bring us food we, yeah. we grow in America. Yeah, and we're worried about emissions. Yeah, and the, the other big thing that I noticed. I eat a kiwi, they think we're going to eat. Yeah, almost all of them do. They almost do. Almost all of them do. Like, yeah. oh, are you kidding me? Yeah. They do? Yeah. Well, you know why? It's because you want to go to the store in January through December, yes. so you want to keep yeah, your no apple for a week. Yeah. Yeah. It's right like the, big, the, the biggest <laughs> issue with foreign uh, agriculture is they don't have the environmental rules. So, yeah. Yeah. so your your bears, your, your cortevas, and your syngentas, when it gets banned in the U.S. and France mm -hmm. or in Europe, it, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's an yeah. insult. So, are you growing your own garden then? We have a garden. It's not. We just moved into a house a year and a half ago, or a year ago now, a year last month. Um, so we're not there yet. My family wants to dig up the whole place. And I'm a grass guy. Yeah. But, but I also know how much energy and time a garden takes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a little crispy today. Yep. You know, like, so in South Dakota, yeah. we, had, we had two acres, and we had gardens, and it was like, you know, mid-June, July, it was a train wreck. Yeah, that's why I stopped. Because the kids get busy, and it's like, hey, uh, I can't, I can't spend eight hours a day out. So it is a full time job. Yeah, so. it is. Well, it's in fun. here in Florida, it's like it, middle of June. I pretty much just let it go. Yeah. It's just too hot. It's just too hot. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. No. Thank you for joining.